Hello, my name is Dean Tudor, and I'm a SPIA contract administrator in Northwest Washington. Welcome to this presentation. You know, SPIA engineers and technical workers take pride in the work they do, and they're very proud to be part of the American aerospace industry. So sometimes when they're skeptical of the impact of decisions made by corporate executives in Chicago, or even critical of them, it's because they care so much about their company and they're concerned about the direction it's going. This presentation is a review of Boeing's previous unsuccessful attempt to manipulate a contract vote of the members of the International Association of Machinists, Local 751, in 2008. The result of this effort, unfortunately, was a 57-day strike. A lot of what I'm going to be talking about is how that occurred. One of the things I'll be talking about is compliance tactics. These are communications intended to increase the probability of positive responses to requests. These weren't created by academic social psychologists, but they've been studied by them. They were created by people whose livelihoods depend on getting positive responses to requests, who want us to trust them and to believe that what they tell us is true. People like salesmen, scammers, and politicians. Here's a neutral example to help you understand what I'm talking about. Imagine a line at a copier in a university library. An experimenter walks up to one of the people in the line and asks if he can cut in. He's holding paper. 60% of the people responded yes. When the experimenter added the words, I'm in a hurry, 94% of the people responded yes. Didn't cost him any more to do that and only took about three quarters of a second more to add that to his request, yet it made a statistically significant difference in how people responded and how willing they were to say yes. So the purpose of compliance tactics is to exploit natural human tendencies to produce statistically abnormal results. Not all of these tactics will work on all people in all circumstances. Abraham Lincoln's famous for the quote, you can fool some of the people all of the time and all of the people some of the time, but you cannot fool all of the people all of the time. There's another similar quote that goes, you can fool some of the people all of the time and those are the ones you want to concentrate on. Well, it's a very cynical idea. And when I first saw it, it was attributed to an American politician. As I tried to track it down, I found out nobody had really said it, but the authors tended to attribute it to people that they just didn't like. So who's most vulnerable to compliance tactics? The research says it's people over 50 years of age, people who will self-identify as independent thinkers and have consistency as a high value. Vulnerability to these compliance tactics isn't a fault. It's a natural human condition, but it should make us more wary when we're asked to comply with requests. So it leaves to open the question, how many SPIA members do you have to fool to get a bad contract through a contract vote. Here's a little formula that expresses it. Since these votes are done on a majority basis, they have to get more than half of the people who are voting, minus the people who would vote for a bad contract anyway, to vote for a bad contract in order to get it through. So the more union members who vote, the harder it is for a company to manipulate the results. So be sure to vote on company union contract offers and encourage others to do the same. Going back to 2008, here's an article written by Dominic Gates in the Seattle Times on July 30th. First it quotes Mark Blondin of IAM 751. So far, all they are talking about is takeaways, Mark Blondin said. If that continues over the next couple of weeks, they are in deep trouble. Then it quotes Doug Kite from the Boeing negotiations team. We're about three weeks away from moving to the hotel for the final phase of negotiations, Doug Kite wrote. I am pleased with our progress. How did these two individuals, who claim to be witnessing the same negotiations, come to two extremely different conclusions about what was really happening? How did they get to here? Part of the answer 
is what was then a new approach in Puget Sound for communicating to union members in the Boeing workplace. In a video that Doug Kite did on 8-13-2008, he said, you have the right to talk about the issues and the company's perspective on them. That's fair game. He was addressing this comment to Boeing managers. Part of his plan was to have Boeing managers make supportive statements in group meetings or even to individual employees about the quality of the Boeing offers that were to come. Talking about the IAM, he said, they're not used to us doing this with our employees. They're used to controlling the airwaves, not anymore. That's our job as leaders, is to be out in front, talking to our employees. In a separate video called Connecting with Your Team, Our Negotiations Approach, he said, employees want to hear from their managers. They are closest to the work and have credibility. Managers should understand the issues and help employees understand the company's position on those issues. It's true. Research says that most employees want to hear from their supervisors about workplace issues. Then how did this backfire into a 57-day strike? Well, here's one reason. This was issued on Friday, August 22, 2008. It's called Actions for Managers, and in it, first-line supervisors are asked to read the information, reference management fact sheets, and share the message with their employees. Listen to the title, though. IAM Negotiations Update, first offer increases pay, pension, and continues outstanding health care. First offer? What's wrong with this picture? Imagine a young man who just got married, and on his honeymoon he says to his new bride, Darling, I want you to know how very happy I am that you're my first wife. What's wrong with this picture? What manager is going to stand up in front of their employees and defend something that is already characterized by the company as their first offer. They know it's going to be superseded by something else. This is partly why the strategy failed, but there's more. First, let's look at some compliance tactics. The first one is the obligation to repay others. Here's how it works. Doing something for someone creates a sense of indebtedness for them and it stimulates a positive response to a request that would otherwise be refused. This is a powerful social rule that gets twice the number of positive requests than when this tactic is not used. Here's an example. In 1971, in a university art museum, an unsuspecting subject is looking at paintings in a room with someone whom he doesn't know is an experimenter. The experimenter leaves and comes back with two Cokes. Tells the subject, hey, I went out and got myself a drink, thought I'd get one for you too. Gives him the Coke, the other person is happy to get it. They start to chat. In a few minutes, the experimenter asks him if he'll buy a raffle ticket. Twice as many people bought the raffle tickets, even though they cost 10 times as much as the Coke than when the Coke wasn't offered. That's not all of the bad news, however. These results hold even if the person who does the favor for us is someone we don't like. They hold for uninvited first favors, and they hold when the request clearly exceeds the favor that was done. Did Boeing try to create a sense of indebtedness for the machinists in 2008? The next piece was published on Saturday, August 23, 2008, and it's entitled, IAM Negotiations Update, Our Continuing Dialogue as Part of the Process. Here's what it says. We delivered Friday's initial offer earlier than ever before in our negotiations history with the IAM. And that's a positive step. By starting earlier, we spent more time working through much of the contract, allowing us to present a full, detailed offer this early in the process. So the emphasis here is, we did this for you, trying to incur a feeling of indebtedness on the part of the machinists who would be voting on the contract offer. But starting sooner and finishing sooner doesn't necessarily mean that more time was invested in the process. It just slid to the left. And union members don't want a bad offer that's issued early. They're willing to wait for a good offer that's negotiated fairly, not just management putting lipstick on a pig and calling it beautiful. Let's look at another compliance tactic. 
I call this the hate and switch, and here's how it works. A request is made that involves an expense for the other person. The request has to be credible, but clearly expensive. When this request is rejected, then a second request, less expensive, is made. When that second request is viewed as a concession, a debt is incurred. And that's not the end of the bad news. When this tactic is used successfully, it triples the rate of compliance with the request. Requests backfire into resentment less frequently when the tactic is used than when not. People actually agree not only more often, they comply more reliably with the requests and freely volunteer to perform future requests. When people feel that they wrangled the second request from a reluctant party, they're more satisfied with it because they believe they run concessions from the other side. This is a typical tactic used by management throughout the United States in union negotiations. Did Boeing try this on the machinists? Watch the timeline that we're about to see. Follow the dates because what happened here was nothing short of a miracle. As you recall, on August 23rd, the company said, we delivered Friday's initial offer earlier than ever before in our history with the IAM. On Tuesday, August 26th, they said, since presenting our first offer, we've spent a great deal of time meeting with the IAM to focus on their contract priorities. We have made substantial movement in pay, pension, and health care. We've withdrawn key proposals that were important to the company, but of concern to the union. Even if they met continuously from Friday through Tuesday, it's difficult to believe that something occurred in that short time that wrung major concessions from the company. Yet that's exactly what's being asserted here. Management's goal was to persuade union members that the company made major concessions so they would regard the second offer in a better light by comparing it only to the first. That's what this tactic is about. Instead, it looks like the second offer was prepared in advance and the company just allowed a few days to pass before dropping it on the union. The next company announcement adds credence to this view. On Thursday, August 28th, just two days later, the company published this statement. After more than four months of listening to the union and our employees and responding to their top priorities, today we presented our best and final offer. It is an outstanding offer. I'm proud to stand behind it. Just two days later came management's best and final offer. There wasn't much negotiating happening there. In addition to the abbreviated timeline, please note the distinction made in this statement between our employees and the union as if those were two separate entities. It completely neglects the fact that the union members are all employees of the Boeing Company. This is a divisive tactic and you'll see this again and again. The idea here is to get people to distinguish in their minds between being an employee and being in a union. In fact, one complements the other. Unfortunately, Boeing got a bad surprise. On Friday, August 29th, they issued this statement. We've got an offer here that's the best in the industry with significant increases in pay and pension and outstanding health care, said Kite. We are disappointed the union is recommending our employees reject it. Again, here's this artificial distinction between the union and our employees, as if those employees weren't also union members who got to vote on the contract. Let's take a look at another compliance tactic. Playing the victim is one you may see often. It exists all over in the workplace, sometimes even our own families, especially in in-laws. Here's how it works. Playing the victim is intended to create sympathy for the person who's characterizing themselves as the victim in that situation. It deflects attention from the substantive issues and directs attention to the victim's complaint. In many cases, it masks the victim's real power. For example, the Boeing Company is an international Fortune 500 corporation. It directs accusations of guilt at the other party and creates an obligation for somebody else to fix the problem. I can't fix it because I'm the victim. When their best and final offer was rejected, especially after all the malarkey they threw at union members, did Boeing try to play the victim? Let's see. Scott Carson 
issued this statement on September 3rd, 2008. The decision by the International Association of Machinists and Aerospace Workers, now once again note, it's the union's decision, not his employees, to reject our contract offer is deeply disappointing, to say the least. He goes on to say, our company went to extraordinary lengths to conduct these negotiations in an atmosphere of openness and transparency. I'm sorry, that's not true. The only thing that was transparent was the company's effort to trick the employees. Let's look at another compliance tactic. This tactic concerns the power inherent in authority, or at least in the perception of power inherent in authority. Here's how it works. People tend to respond to symbols of authority over substance. In the United States, we tend to respond more readily to symbols of authority than we'd really like to admit. We defer because we believe those people can compel our compliance. We want to avoid punishment. In order for this tactic to work, three things have to be there. There has to be power, there has to be belief in that power, and there has to be obedience in the form of wanting to avoid punishment. Last, threats of punishment can be either explicit or implied. One of the most famous studies on this subject is called the Milgram Study. It was done in 1961 at Yale University, and there were 40 subjects. There's a wonderful article about this in Wikipedia, and you can read more about it. The main point I want to make about the Milgram Study is people responded to a symbol of authority, a white lab coat, and did things that they would have found morally reprehensible had they been asked in advance if they were willing to do it. In 2008, Boeing never publicly threatened members of the IAM Local 751. Unfortunately, that's not the case in current SPIA negotiations. In an interview with Susanna Ray of Bloomberg on September 6, 2012, entitled, Boeing May Use Engineers Beyond Hub If Union Box on Pay, Mike Delaney said that unless the company wins competitive labor costs and union contracts, they may move the work out of Puget Sound. In effect, he's saying, if you don't accept their pay offer, if you don't vote the way we want you to on union contracts, they'll outsource your work. That's how much they care about you. I've had SPIA members tell me when they read this interview, they felt like Delaney was calling them a commodity and saying, we own you, we can buy you and sell you. Unless you do exactly what we want, we're going to ship your work somewhere else. I hope he wasn't saying that, because that would be a shameful thing for a corporate executive to say. So here's what you can do. Stay focused on your objectives. Throughout contract negotiations, ask for data to support representations that management may make to you about their contract offers. Tell SPIA when management tries to deal directly with you about contract voting. Take into account the needs of your coworkers when you do vote. Demonstrate your solidarity with SPIA and your coworkers by participating in workplace activities. Send the message to corporate that you do care and that you do know what's happening. Finally, hold management accountable by voting against bad offers. If you're interested in reading more about rhetorical devices or compliance tactics, I've listed four resources you might want to start with. In the meantime, thank you for your time and attention. Think hard, play straight.